Very nice to have you here with us from the Financial Times Studios connected to your Milano office. It's uh, great to have uh, this coffee chat together. So, Davide, if uh, you were in your 20s now and you are living in such unprecedented times of uh, changes, what uh, is uh, your piece of advice you would give to yourself to grow your career in such a difficult time for the world, generally. Thank you, Virginia. And thank you to the ST and Bocconi for this opportunity. I would say, first of all, um, I would just repeat what I was told when I was young. I had a couple of key mentors. So the first important advice is follow your passion. Uh, you need to be in love with what you do. It's not just a job, it has to be your passion. So every morning when you get up, You need to get that kind of kick to say, it's fantastic, that's what I'm doing. Secondly, follow a key mentor. Always look at your boss. Are you learning from him? Is he a good person? Uh, is he going to help you progress and basically achieve professional maturity? Third, as you become older and you start having some winnings, uh, remember, there are basically two paths in life. Freedom and money is a big power. And my advice was given, always choose freedom and money and not power. And that's because ultimately, if you want to change the world and you want to be happy, your own freedom is priceless. And you can only achieve it with maximum uh, passion in what you do. And ultimately, results will follow. So don't let your career be basically uh, be taken away by short-term profit targets or, you know, promotions or titles, uh, follow the substance and not the image. Based on this answer that you just gave, Davide, uh, we would uh, like to know uh, one big mistake that maybe you made in your career that uh, you have learned the most from. Yes. So I think, um, let's say, I never got wrong my passion. I knew what I liked. Secondly, I never got wrong the mentor, hence I knew who were the key leaders to follow. What I got wrong is when then it's up to me to pull the trigger, in particular in a couple of investments, was uh, basically not having experience and following more my brain than my own guts. When you're young, you think the numbers always tell the truth, but when you invest as an investor, the future is never certain by definition. And sometimes when you have a feeling that the numbers do not tell all the truth or the numbers might not be right, that's when I made a mistake. This is one of the reasons why actually investing, it's a job that with time you become better. You're like a old good wine. Um, and if you follow the action of some of the people that have been lucky enough to have as mentor, as time goes by, they become better and better, stronger and stronger, smarter and smarter. And this is why I think investing, it's a fantastic career because basically with time you become better. And there are not many jobs like this. When I was young, I was an athlete. Uh, one day my dad told me I was a professional volleyball player in Italy, uh, made it to Serie A Uno, the first division. And one day he told me, Davide, your career is not to be at the peak of 2025 like any sportsman is. You should be at your peak at 60-65. And I think that's the difference between being an athlete and being an investor. It's a marathon and it's not a sprint. And I think everyone should take their own career in this path. Think about the long term, not the short term, and train as if it's a marathon and not a sprint. In 2017, there was an interview of yours on the FT where you were uh, chatting about Brexit and you said something that um, I think is really important for our challengers. You said, if I'm ever asked to um, hire British first, I would move algebras from London, so I wouldn't keep it in uh, um, in the city. So you have uh, this investment boutique with uh, uh, 70 employees and is worth billions. So my uh, question for you is, what's the value for such a worthy company and for you as an entrepreneur about diversity and inclusion in your teams? And uh, maybe you as a team player, not just as a founder, what is the value that you give to diversity? You know, we have 135 people around the world in eight offices. 
17 different nationalities and we're a truly melting pot. On top, we are 45% female and 55% male compared to an industry average, which is 2080. Now, because our fiduciary mandate is to run money for our investor in the best possible way, and we've been one of the fastest growing boutique in Europe, what I've learned as an entrepreneur, as an investor, is that diversity and melting pot is the winning formula. But when you are a truly meritocratic firm, then nothing else matters. So it's not a question of diversity. It's a question you need to bring the best team. What I've realized empirically is the more diverse, the better it is. You don't have group thinking and you don't have stereotypes. And that, I think, keeps everyone honest. So Brexit, I think, unfortunately, will set probably London back. Because if I think over the last 25, 30 years, it attracted the best brain around Europe that was often trained in other countries and came and worked in Europe. I fear that this ain't going to happen for the next 10 to 20 years. Of course, London is going to keep its dominance uh, for a while. The key question is what's going to happen in 10, 15 years time. And only time will be able to tell. As far as we are concerned, you know, we were about 60, 70 people uh, 40 years ago pre-Brexit. We have now doubled and we have not added a single person in London. All the growth actually has come in foreign offices. And that's because now whatever we do in the UK has to mainly serve a UK market. But because the world is a big place, I want to put people that they can serve the world and not just the UK. What are your three core habits that make you Davide Serra and CEO and founder of Algebris? I think there are a couple of key qualities an entrepreneur needs to have. First, you must have trained, studied hard to gain some competence. I don't think when you're 23 out of university, you have lots of experience, no knowledge, you might have a great idea, but there are so many things that you still don't know. So my best advice is train for 10 years, learn, save some money, have some capital, and most importantly, refine all those skills that you will need. I think launching a firm as I did when I was 35, to be honest, you're still very young, but you're mature enough uh, to know what you actually want and secondly, to have done enough mistakes so that you don't make them when you're an entrepreneur. Because once you make mistakes as an entrepreneur, you pay the full price. Third, in my case, there was a point where I was a highly paid analyst on the sales side in a fantastic firm, Morgan Stanley. I love the people, I love my clients. Uh, but eventually, there was something where I said, listen, if it's true that whatever I think has the capacity to make money, I should be able to do it for myself rather than for someone else. And I think you need to become an entrepreneur only when you have that urge of actually running your own show, being accountable for it, not be able to blame anybody else and uh, set up your own rules of engagement in your own firm. It got to a point where I spent you know, more time in the office than with my family and friends and hence the people I had around me were key. And so I took the decision to build my own firm so that we would only have people I'll enjoy happy to share basically a great part of my life uh, with a vision and a goal uh, you know to basically build uh, one of the best investment firm in Europe. If you're a student today how you can develop such a um, skill habit as the one of being resilient? It's a very good question listen I for example develop resilience by being an athlete you know I was in high school I had to train 12 14 times a week uh, often skip school on Thursday because I had basically training also in the morning. So then I had to study late in the evening, very little, if no social life, uh, teetotal till the age of 25. So there were many sacrifices around my life as an athlete in my early days. But that uh, sacrifice, focus, determination, learning how to train and knowing that with no training there's no winning and learning how to lose and to win and when you fall back on your knees, how to stand up. For me, those were the most important lessons in life that basically helped me uh, develop the firm. So I think there are many ways you can develop resilience. I mean, uh, for example, uh, right now we're getting a, a kid that has been, you know, world champion in uh, rowing uh, on the juniors team. Um, I had people, that, you know, women that did ballet and uh, you know i had people that were singers or musicians it doesn't really matter what makes you more resilient 
as long as you, through your life, you did that very hard testing, you learned the training and you learned to master the art of uh, hard work and be able to stand up once you fail. And those experiences, no business class, no business schools, or even studies will be able to teach you. And so I think you need those extra clicker activity that, that help you become a more rounded person and a stronger person. And uh, as a result, I always look for CV, not just grades, uh, not just for the IQ and the brain, not just skills language, but what is about you that makes you a stronger and a better person. As you have, uh, I think you have been uh chatting a lot about sports and uh, how much uh, sacrifice in sports can help entrepreneurs or generally people that enter in the business ecosystem. Um, I know that you are a very keen alpinist. So what you have learned and what are your thoughts that maybe you can rely on in the business world when you're climbing? That's a very good question. When I stopped playing volleyball, um, a friend of mine was an alpine guide and I started climbing with him at a very young age, 16, 17. So I became a keen alpinist and skier. Um, there are many things that I love about the Alps and mountains. First, you know, it's the most democratic environment on the planet. It doesn't matter who you are, uh, what your parents are, how much money you have. We're all equal above 3000 meters. Secondly, there is no widget or gadget uh, or anything that can get you ahead. It's yourself and nature. Third, it's not just physical, but it's often a journey with yourself. You need to understand the risks, your skills, respect nature, which is always much stronger than you are. Fourth, it teaches you teamwork. When you belay with someone uh, in a rope party, when you climb and you attach your rope to someone else, your life is at risk and vice versa. And I think that helps you to understand the concept of risk management in a very intimate way. Um, and as I served in the Alpine rescue team, I've seen what happens when things go wrong. And last but not least, um, it forces you to keep a massive discipline. Um, and particularly as time goes by and uh, you become less strong physically, you need to adapt, use your technique, your experience, um, and hence, um, as an investor, as an entrepreneur, I think these are all skills that you can use, adapt, and replicate in business life. Um, and I think um, the beauty and the feeling of being on top of the mountain after having studied, researched, uh, you know, your route, uh, testing it, asking others that have already done it, it really resembles uh, to business life. And that's why I truly love it. And it's my passion. Thank you. Grazie mille. And uh, thanks for your time today. I think uh, people are going to love this. So, Grazie, Virginia. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye.